Welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created and might never do again. So the other day, actually now it was like probably months ago, I was on the internet, definitely not minding my own business, and I was looking up Lima Yevremovich's deleted posts from her Instagram account. As you all know, you can find archived posts from people on the internet. It's public information. Go look them up yourself. I don't know if it's still up, but it definitely was a few months ago. And I came across this post. Oh, the timeline of this is the best part, to be honest. So I, I know a lot of y'all probably already know who this person is. You're gonna know because the title, the thumbnail, whatever. I did not really know who the person was. So I'm gonna bring you through the investigation as I did it, and then we'll get to you know who exactly is Tony Shea and all of that. But I'm just looking, I see this post was posted on November 29th, 2020. Now for timeline purposes, if you're a follower of this channel, then you will remember Amanda Rabb from the Virtual Reality Hell series. Now, if you follow my first channel, That Surprise Witness TV, you will also know that a whole lot of stuff was going on right around November 29th, 2020. I took a lift from the house because we were arguing Plus, like, all the other stress I had. I'm like, to everybody... To the bridge. To the bridge in Chicago. And I, um, I'm i like, I'm just going to myself. So I get to the bridge, and it's so low. And I'm like, if I jump off this thing, I'm going to survive. And then we're going to have helicopters. <laughs> and then everyone's going to be like, mental health founder. I'll probably end up on the No Jumper uh, Instagram account. Yeah. Mental health founder, CEO jumps off the bridge, you know. <laughs> That's cool that you're so tapped in that you, so. you perceived the meme before it happened. Yeah. <laughs> if you've been following the virtual reality hell story and the Facts Ain't Defamation playlist on That Surprise Witness TV, then you will know Lima Yevremovich went on Adam Grand Mason's podcast to tell everyone in the world that while she was in charge of Amanda Rabb's treatment and care, that she was also facing bleep thoughts and ideations and she went so far as to on thanksgiving day go to a bridge in chicago to effectuate and to act upon those thoughts and ideations well according to her her husband called the police and they were all able to kind of literally talk her down off of the bridge and then she claims that she stayed in her bedroom at her in-laws house for three days after that well exactly three days after thanksgiving day is when she posted this on lima from ara it's a picture of Tony Shea, and it says 1973 to 2020. And it's a quote from him. It says, things are never as bad or as good as they seem. Then Lima puts a caption, and the caption reads as follows. Today, I was devastated to learn that my role model, mentor, and friend has passed. Tony was one of the first to believe in the concept of Aura when I was first starting out. He connected me with his team and welcomed me into his home. His guidance paved the path for my focus on Las Vegas. And because of Tony's generosity and extending his network to me, I was able to secure the first clinics to use Aura in Las Vegas. Now, if you will recall, in May 2021, Amanda Rabb unfortunately and tragically unexpectedly lost her life in a rehabilitation clinic in Las Vegas called Desert Hope, which is an American Addiction Center's treatment center. But now here we have, in 2020, Lima saying the reason that she even is in Las Vegas at all is because of her connection to Tony Shea. She goes on to say, I was able to secure the first clinics to use Aura in Las Vegas, and the city has since become a second home to me. The culture I hold at Aura is entirely modeled after the Zappos model. Tony's untraditional values in business and delivering happiness transcend past in-house workspace culture and have shifted to drive change in communities and have transformed downtown Las Vegas. As we scale our Vegas initiative, we will do it in Tony's name, which doesn't seem to actually have been the case because I never heard her say his name in my life. Uh, she didn't mention his name on Mark Leta. She didn't mention his name on Adam Grand Mason. She didn't mention his name on the shit post she made about me. So I don't, I don't really think this is even true. Our team is dedicated to grant accessibility to mental health care where people die and have seizures in your care. Okay, okay, cool. Um, to those who lack opportunities and to expand the culture Tony dedicated his life to build. The effects he has had on humanity will continue, she, she misspelled continue, 
to live in through my actions. Quote, envision, create, and believe in your own universe and the universe will form around you. So then she tags him and she puts a bunch of other tags, RIP, Vegas Strong, Inspire, Zappos, CEO Life, Motivation, Never Give Up, Mental Health, Mental Health Awareness, Depression, Anxiety, Self-Love. So now, of course, obviously I'm thinking, well, what happened to this man? He seemed pretty young. She didn't say, oh, he lost his battle with cancer, but she sure did use the hashtag um, CEO life and mental health, depression, anxiety, self-love. So of course y'all know I dug deep and this is what I found. Tony Shea was born to Taiwanese immigrants on December 13th, 1973. He sold his first company, Link Exchange, to Microsoft in 1998 for $265 million. He started Zappos in 1999 and 10 years later sold it to Amazon for a reported $1.2 billion. He was known for his untraditional management style and weird antics. It's whether you're at the office or outside the office and so definitely always try to act in a way that's consistent with both our core values that we have as a company which basically are also my own personal values and uh, also keep in mind kind of the overall uh, mission of the company which is about delivering happiness. Well clearly he was known for that because Lima even mentioned it in her eulogy, and I'm glad she that she was able to take time from her own mental health crisis to post a eulogy to Tony Shay. He even, as we mentioned earlier, believed in Aura. Lima called him a role model, a mentor, and a friend who she wanted to model Aura's workplace after. In August 2020, after serving as CEO for over 20 years, Tony was... It's, it's a little bit contested whether he was fired or whether Amazon just kind of stopped working with him or if he had voluntarily stepped down. But after about two decades of working as the CEO of Zappos, even after selling the company to Amazon, he did retire. On one fateful day in November 2020, Tony was rushed to the hospital after suffering injuries from smoke inhalation. At least that was what was reported. By Thanksgiving Day, a few days later, Tony was dead. The cause of the fire was ruled by the New London, Connecticut Fire Department as, quote, undetermined, because there were a lot of possible variables that could have led to the fire, and there was actually a history of fires happening at this location. Importantly, Tony was reported to have passed away from the injuries he sustained related to smoke inhalation. The publicly available police report says that the fire department was notified of Shay's death on November 27th, so that's two days before Lima posted her post. And according to the medical examiner's investigator, Shay had a brain edema from the hot gases and soot from the fire, and he was placed on a ventilator. That sounds familiar. Who else was on a ventilator recently? Oh, but was he? The police report also states that the family requested Tony be extubated. It wasn't the first time that firefighters had been called to the home. Only two days before the November 18th fire, New London firefighters had twice responded to the 500 Pico Avenue home for a fire alarm. Firefighters on the second response had discovered smoke in the basement melted plastic on the stove, and an unattended candle burning in an unsafe location. So prior to that November 18th fire, the November 18th fire is the one that ultimately ended up resulting in Tony's death, but he didn't die on the 18th. He passed away like 10 days later or so on the 27th. Now, there are conflicting news reports. Some news reports state that he actually passed away on Thanksgiving Day, the 26th. I don't know which is which, but I'm gonna go with what the police, what is being reported the police report says, which is the 27th, but I really don't know. You can do your own investigation, that would be great. But before that November 18th fire, the one that eventually led to his death 10 or 11 days later, the firefighters were already called to that house twice on one day. And on that day, they found all kinds of fire hazards, melted plastic on the stove, open candles burning, things just in unsafe locations, and the fire alarm was in indeed going off. So we can't get anything done on this channel if we don't have a timeline, so let's start with the timeline. 
Going back all the way to 2015, we see that Lima is commenting on Tony's official Instagram account, something about a llama, something about missing the llama. Four or five years later, 2019, four years later, Aura is founded. So we know that Lima knew Tony by 2015, at least enough to be commenting on his Instagram as if she knew him. And then four years later, she founds Aura. But don't forget, Aura wasn't her first attempt at entrepreneurship. She tried that other prison thing, The Last Star, which was founded the year before. So it looks like she was maybe asking Tony for his advice because she said he was one of the first people to believe in the concept, which to me means the concept must predate the incorporation date of the business. So he must have been in her life before 2019, unless she's a big fat liar, which I mean, she's lied about other stuff, so. Who knows, your guess is as good as mine. November 2019, that very same year, it just so happens, huge coincidence, that Tony began to experiment with the psychoactive substance called ketamine or ketamine. Now the next year, Tony, it is reported that Tony began using nitrous oxide to also act as a psychoactive substance. These are colloquially known as whippets on the street. Um, my questions here are who provided that? Brother, assistant, question mark? And we'll get into it because there is lawsuits and all kinds of things coming up. So we do know in 2020 is when Tony had started using the whippets recreationally or perhaps spiritually, we really don't know. February 2020, Shay agreed to go to a short stint at a rehab in Park City where he owned a small vacation home he used during the Sundance Film Festival each year. But Tony reportedly did not think that he needed that rehab. He paid nearly $16 million during 2020 to buy a mountain compound where he could form a utopian, COVID-free community with his growing entourage. Now, I mean, listen, if, if Lima's calling this man one of her best friends and her mentor, I just must, I just have to ask myself, is she in the entourage? She said Vegas was like a second home to her. I mean, I don't know, I really don't know. I, these are just questions I'm asking myself. The nine bedroom, 13 bath main house sat on 18 acres of land with a private lakefront beach. The deal included a multi-million dollar enticement for the owners to move out immediately. It's also reported widely that during the year 2020, Tony started to suffer immensely with his mental health. And again, I wasn't there, I don't know, I'm just telling y'all what was reported in the news, but it stated that the isolation and the quarantines and all of that was really taking a toll on Tony and on his mental health because he was a very social person. And it's been reported in the news, one of Tony's motivations for purchasing this $16 million mansion on a mountain on 18 acres is because he was suffering so immensely. So he wanted to get his, you know, little quarantine group together and just fine, I have my community here at least. Soon after he bought the mountain, he was offering to double the salary of anyone who agreed to join his Park City group. The deal drew a flock of flunkies who busied themselves by coming up with harebrained business schemes. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Like launching hot air balloons from the ranch's backyard, and Tony would fund all of these harebrained projects generously. There was just no incentive for these people to help get him well, a close associate said. So that was in February, he's buying the mountain, he's getting people to come over there. You know, obviously all the lockdowns and things started around March, April. So by June, 2020, Tony has a meeting with Amazon as the CEO of Zappos and he was reportedly incoherent. So in late June, that same month, Tony tr was transported to a hospital where an anonymous friend asked for Tony not to be released as it would be a problem. Oh, uh-oh, mm. Now we're starting to get into forced isolation, forced psychiatric medical confinement, forced incarceration without a jury, without a judge, just some anonymous friend is calling up to the hospital saying don't release him from the hospital because it's gonna be a problem. People are acting like hospitals are jails. That's not what they for. But we see it happen time and time again with rich, powerful, famous people. One day we're finally gonna do a video about the CEO of Viacom who got the whole company ripped out from underneath him. Sam Ingham is involved, Adam Streisand is involved, Vivian Lee Thorin, I believe, was involved. So we'll get to that one day, but not today. In late June 2020, people around Tony calling themselves friends were calling and telling the hospital not to let him out because it would, quote, be a problem. 
Allegedly, he had been hospitalized after smashing up his Park City, Utah mansion and threatening to harm himself. Couple months goes by, now we're in August. He retires from Zappos with no official announcement or public celebration. There's no party, there's no send off, he's just retired. That same month, the famous singer Jewel visited Tony in Utah and she unfortunately predicted correctly that he was going to die. So in October, one of the lawyers who would later become involved in arguing over the administration of Tony's estate would say, the family consulted with a medical doctor to discuss having Tony involuntarily committed. That same fall, 2020, Shea took his entourage on a frenzied travel spree, like a, a road trip of sorts, from Utah to Alaska to Puerto Rico to Connecticut, where they stayed at the waterside home of a woman named Rachel Brown. Now, Rachel, it is disputed whether she was a girlfriend or a former girlfriend, but she was a romantic interest of Tony's, and they did have a long history romantically. Now, it was her house that was in Connecticut that was where ultimately that fire happened and the fire department had been called a few days before the ultimate fire happened. So Rachel Brown, his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, but still friends or whatever, owned that home. So they were on this sort of like road trip. I'm saying road trip, but I think they were flying as well. In late October, it seems that they had reportedly, they had ended up in the Connecticut home and they were only there for a while because they were gonna go somewhere else afterwards, I think Hawaii or something. So on October 29th, 2020, which is only nine days after the Zappos transaction closed, Tony was taken yet again to the emergency room after stating that he believed that he was quote, crystallizing. He believed he was in a simulation, that he had been chewing cigarettes and professing quote, I just don't know what's real and what's not. Now that was from lawyers in court documents. As the group still prepared to head to Hawaii, leave Connecticut and go to Hawaii, for the next leg of their trip, Tony's elderly dog, Blitzy, who was half blind and ailing, had to be put to sleep. Now this seems to be the catalyst that really sent Tony reeling. The dog was buried in Rachel Brown's backyard in Connecticut, which is where that ultimate fire where he did die later from the injuries sustained at that fire. So they buried him in the backyard in Connecticut, November 15th. November 18th, just three days after Blitzy passed away, was the ultimate fire at the Connecticut home. November 26th, maybe 27th, Tony passes away surrounded by family who had been plotting to have him involuntarily committed. Like, lawyers said this, not me. I'm just telling y'all what they said, okay. Without a will, y'all believe that Tony Shea died with no will? Because that's what Vivian Lee Thorine said. Oh, we'll get to her. Yes, ma'am. Spoiler alert. Pew, 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 pew. But that's what they're reporting without a will. So the whole thing goes to the probate court. Yay. We know how those things work. So then November 29th, three days after he passes away, and I guess three days after the bridge incident, Lima makes her Instagram post honoring Tony, saying she wanted to make Ara's workplace the same as Zappos. So then you have this guy named Dave Marlin, who's the CEO of Crossroads Nevada, an addiction resource program. He says that he's a close friend of Tony and he makes a, he makes a comment and he's quoted as saying, as a person who is in long-term recovery, when I saw alcohol at a workplace, it raises my eyebrows. I don't know anything about Zappos workplace environment. I, I did not spend a lot of time researching that particular aspect here, but it does seem as though alcohol at the workplace was allowed. So I'm wondering, does Ara have alcohol just floating around at the workplace? Who knows? Lima is the one who said she wanted to model Ara's workplace after Zappos, not me. I didn't say that. I just read it from the Instagram post. Uh, Marlon also says that he knew Tony over the years and in the course of his work in downtown Las Vegas and at Zappos, he said that he had toured the headquarters multiple times. He says, quote, I toured Zappos many times and I was always surprised about the prominence of alcohol culturally and at workstations. It was very common for them to have alcohol there. Zappos headquarters, where Tony has thrown out the traditional corporate rule book. Come on, Tony. See? <laughs> Gone are the titles, dress code, and corporate hierarchy. Mm, I love him. Instead, 
meetings in this Star Wars themed conference room. Who does the decorating around here? Uh, we really leave it up to employees. It's all part of a big push by Tony towards something called a holacracy. Who's the boss? We're the boss. You're the boss. We're the boss. Essentially removing upper management and letting employees run the show. Do you ever fight with each other? No. We love each other. The employees even determine their own salaries. We have a budget that uh, we are allowed, and there's eight of us that we determine how our pay would be. So could this be the model of the future? You want to come to work. You want to be here even on your day off. Some say, if the shoe fits. <laughs> For Nightline, I'm Rebecca Jarvis in New York. They're trying to revolutionize how business is done and how people work. And they're having a party doing it. One night, it was a toga party. Work hard, play hard. Are you guys ready to have a good time? Yeah. Tour the Zappos offices, and there's a cheerfulness you won't find in the dour offices of corporate America. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Every department has its own way of greeting visitors. Zappos is headquartered in Las Vegas, where they do have office carols like almost any other corporation. But right there in the middle, we may have missed him. There he is, Tony Shea, the emperor of shoes, with no more office space than Dilbert. One of the things that's really important for us, uh, actually probably the most important focus for Zappos, is to make sure we have the absolute best company culture. And part of our culture is just having a family-like atmosphere. <laughs> And at times it looks like one of those internet startups that disappeared when the bubble burst. Go! Here's the entire finance department racing Pinewood Derby cars in the office. But unlike those failed startups, last year Zappos made a 5% profit. Sari Levine already works in the design department, but she was a member of the latest call center class. And just before they were hired, she and the rest were offered cash to walk away. We are actually increasing the offer to $2,000, but you, today is the last day where you can <laughs> choose it. We offer them money to trainees to quit because we really want to make sure that people that are working at Zappos are truly passionate about the company and this is the place that they want to be. Very few take it. Are you ready to get started? Yeah. For the graduates, there's a ceremony and circumstance, diplomas, the Zappos Pledge. I'm on a Zappos mission to live and deliver wow. I'm on a Zappos mission to live and deliver wow. Armed with core values, I'm going to start now. Armed with core values, I'm going to start now. So that's the type of workplace we're talking about. It seems like a lot of people really do like it and think it's great, but it just makes me wonder if Aura is supposed to be this addiction recovery thing, is it really responsible or even a good business move to be having kegs and shit all over your damn office. I don't think so, but what do I know? I ain't nobody. So in December, just a few days later, December 2nd, the probate judge gives Tony's brothers and father control over Tony's money or his estate, citing that Tony could be worth at least a billion, that's with a B, dollars. That was December, and then of course the new year rolls around, now we're in 2021. January 21st, the estate terminates its contract with Tony Lee, who was Tony Shea's longtime financial advisor, and he later would sue the estate as a result of this termination. That was January. Now in February, a longtime assistant, Mimi Pham, files suit as well against Tony's estate, suing the brother and the father for their administration of Tony's money. Now, by April, Tony Lee, that financial advisor that got fired in January, he had sued the estate. So the longtime financial advisor and the longtime personal assistant both sued the brother and the father who were basically the Jamie Spears and Andrew Wallet of this estate after Tony passed away. Now we roll around to this year, 2022, and the judge proved a settlement on the lawsuit with the longtime assistant, Mimi. And that got settled January earlier this year. Then in September, there's a news article that comes out 
saying that Tony's brother spent his estate funds on frivolous personal luxury items and expenses, including a $100,000 personal trainer and some really expensive luxury car, a Benz or something, Ferrari maybe, some really expensive car. So now, like right now as we speak, the people who took over Tony Shea's estate, the people who presumably were the same ones, presumably, I don't know, I'm speculating, were the same fam concerned family who were ha trying to have him involuntarily committed. Whenever people say famous people and rich people are better off dead than alive, that's true to the grifters. Because then you don't have to deal with that person trying to pay for harebrained whatever they want to spend their money on. Look, listen, do I think that Tony should have been spending his money on harebrained launching hot air balloon? No, but what? Why do I get to have an opinion? That man built businesses and sold them for billions of dollars. Why do I get to have an opinion on how he spends his money? And furthermore, why does his daddy and his brother get to have an opinion? Listen, it does seem like Tony was in a very bad space, mentally, emotionally, possibly spiritually. If news reports are to be believed, he was stating things like, I don't know what's real and what's not. I feel like I'm in a simulation, which girl relatable, but don't put me in a conservatorship. I don't have no money, okay? In September, as we were saying, this news article comes out saying Tony's brother spent estate funds frivolously. Andy is that guy's name. Andy thought that Tony, at the time of his making contracts with Mimi, the former personal assistant, and Tony Lee, the former financial advisor, the brother, after Tony Shea passes away, the brother, Andy, who is now being accused of spending Tony's money on bad, on frivolous things, cars and stuff. That guy's like, oh, well, the reason that I had to terminate the contracts was because when my brother was alive and when he made these contracts, he wasn't in his right mind. So still you see the same story over and over. How many rich and famous people do we have to see their family saying they weren't making good decisions over and over again? How many times does it have to happen before we start to say like, maybe the guy just wanted to spend a lot of money on his personal assistant. I, maybe he just did. Because what's the alternative? Have a whole bunch of money left over and let it go to people like the brother who had a very estranged relationship with Tony throughout his life, but all of a sudden showed up and was providing him with whippets according to court documents. This brother who took over the estate is the very same person according to court documents and news articles who was providing him with canister upon canister hundreds of thousands of canisters of whippets. So it's like maybe the reason he wasn't in his right mind was because he was being so enabled by his family. Again, we see this time and again. It's the same thing over and over. And it's gonna keep happening over and over until we wake up and do something about it. We cannot take these tabloids for face value. We have to look a little bit deeper. Andy, in the same paragraph in my notes, Andy said his brother lacked the requisite capacity to approve his own contract. Lawyers for the financial assistant guy, his lawyers wrote that in court documents. And then they said, quote, during the same time frame, Andy was providing Tony, his brother, who's now dead, Zappo CEO, with increasing amounts of nitrous oxide with no concerns that his brother was mentally incompetent. Yet, and this is a, a quote from the lawyers, yet Andy, the brother, hypocritically asserts that the financial advisor, among others, took advantage of Tony in the final months of his life. Let me read that to y'all one more time. During this same time frame, I'm quoting from a court document. During the same time frame that Andy thought his brother lacked the capacity to enter into contracts, he was hypocritically providing increasing amounts of whippets to his brother with seemingly no concern for his mental health at that point, seemingly no concern for whether or not he was competent to inhale thousands of whippets at that point. But now after he is dead and gone, the brother is saying hypocritically, quote, that Lee among others took advantage of Tony in the final months of his life. Now, just a few months ago, Tony's family levels new accusations in a court filing, and Tony's brother is accused again of supplying Tony with nitrous oxide. So as I'm looking into these court documents, which a lot of them are publicly available, and we probably will just end it here, but if, if y'all aren't convinced at this point that there's a sinister and insidious team of probate lawyers who are going around the country basically taking control of the wealthiest and most lucrative estates. Guess whose name pops up in this case? 
representing the executor of the state, the father of the person who made the money. You can't even make this stuff up. If I made this up and wrote it down in fiction, the publisher would say it's too on the nose. It's too deadpan. It's just too on the nose. No one would believe that. But I didn't write it. I didn't make it up. It's the truth. Vivian Lee Thoreen, daddy, 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 the one who likes representing the daddies of the person who made all the money, the one who likes representing the daddies, the ones who didn't actually make the money, but who want to put their talons onto their children's estates because all of a sudden they're not competent to spend their own money. Vivian Lee Thoreen, she's representing the only remaining executor of this estate in Las Vegas. Brittany knows that her daddy loves her. What in the hell? Las Vegas? That's in Nevada, girl. She's licensed. She's a California super lawyer. They will just take these people and pluck them and put them in any case anywhere because they know how they play Miss Half a Million Dollars in Media Matters. So I guess where we can end off is reading this article because it all comes full circle. And I remember reading this article during my research for the Britney Spears case. And this was written last year, October, 2021. The title of the article is, Jamie Spears' attorney, Vivian Lee Thoreen, reportedly requested $2 million in separate estate lawsuit for late Zappos CEO, Tony Shea. Jamie Spears' attorney, Vivian Thoreen, may be asking for large amounts of money in Britney Spears' conservatorship case, but that is not the only legal situation where she's asking people to cough up the cash. According to Radar, which, I mean, take with a grain of salt, in the pop star's headline-making court battle, Thoreen, who works for Holland and Knight Law Firm, asked to be paid $500,000 reportedly for the cost of media matters. Is she a lawyer or a PR firm? Both, that was a trick question. For which Britney's attorney, Matthew Rosengart, refused to pay. But Thoreen is keeping that high cost energy in other cases as well. According to Radar, the legal mind is one of the attorneys on the team that represents the massive estate of late internet entrepreneur and venture capitalist, Tony Shea. After Tony passed away in a random house fire, which, isn't exactly true. He didn't pass away in the house fire. He passed away in the hospital after being extubated. We'll have to look up what extubated means, but I think that means his family pulled him off life support, okay? And then that same family presumably, presumably took control of his estate and now they're being accused of spending his money on luxury cars and personal trainers after being the same family that gave him whippets. Y'all see how that happened? Or I don't know, I don't know. I, just look it up yourself, make your own, make your own conclusion, okay. So after Tony passed away, all aspects of his estate, which was estimated to be worth about $850 million at the time of his death, were handed over to his brother, Andy. In a striking resemblance to Britney's case, Tony had been estranged from his brother for a majority of his life. Same brother, according to this article I'm reading and according to Radar, which take with a grain of salt, but that is what it said, Tony had been estranged from his brother the majority of his life. So in swoops this brother trying to tell him how to spend his money and what to do, all the while enabling his ever spiraling mental health crisis into addiction and other things. According to court documents that were filed on September 22nd, Thoreen and the rest of the legal team in the case denied payment to many of Tony's former employees. But they did ask for fees in the amount of $1.7 million to be approved and granted. And would you be surprised to find out the whole request was granted. So the people that Tony had promised to pay money to didn't get their money. And the people who Tony did not hire, including Vivian Lee Thoreen, did get their request granted, which resulted in almost $2 million going to Vivian Lee Thoreen. <laughs> See how they have the deck stack? Both firms of Holland and Knight and Goldsmith Guyman worked together to represent the Shea estate. Attorney Dara Goldsmith reportedly asked to be paid in the sum of $500 an hour to work on the case. Thoreen tripled that number as she requested, allegedly, to be paid $1,500 an hour for her time spent. In the Spears case, court documents obtained by People magazine that were filed back in April 2021 revealed that Britney's mother, Lynn, had shot down Thoreen's request for four months of fees, totaling $890,000. Lynn Spears, appropriately and correctly in my opinion, citing that the amount was, was procedurally and substantively 
improper. So she's got a million dollars out getting granted by this court, got a 1.7 over here by this other. She's just raking in the money to take over people's estates whose parents think that they're not competent to spend their own money. Now, it's very interesting to me that Tony would have died without a will. I just, I just find that very difficult to believe, but it is what's being reported. So that's all we have to go on. Lynn had alleged in April, 2021 in Brittany's case that some of the services that the law firm wanted to be paid for were not performed in good faith or for the benefit of Brittany herself. Lynn claimed that the firm was performing unnecessary work, such as largely constituted a national media tour orchestrated by Holland and Knight to promote Vivian Lee Thoreen and or combat media coverage that cast Jamie in a negative light. So basically Lynn said in April, 2021 court filings, Vivian Lee Thoreen is asking for money from my daughter's estate to basically make her, to run PR for herself and Jamie. Lynn then requested the courts review the requested documents and that at least $224,000 related to the law firm's communication with the press be immediately repaid to Britney Spears' estate. As I kind of previously said, I just find it very fascinating that there's not a good enough attorney in the whole state of Nevada without them having to go fishing for Vivian Lee Thoreen across state lines in California. She's asking for exorbitant amounts of fees. She's denying other people who Tony had made deals with and had made contracts with their money. It's very similar to Britney's case. And it's very interesting to me that somehow Lima Yavremovich is all tangled up in this by calling Tony her best friend. Let me go see if that post is still up. But I mean, it's, it's something we can definitely talk about in depositions. Definitely, no problem with that. She she had a very interesting 2020. In July, her sisters are going missing. August, she takes over Amanda Rabb's life. September goes by, October, then November rolls around. She's having the bridge incident. Amanda Rabb is in treatment. She has to take out this loan. She can't afford it. Tony dies. She posts about that. It is still up. I don't know if it was ever removed. I could have imagined that, but I just now went to check. As of December 20th, 2022, the Tony remembrance is still up. Today, I was devastated to learn my role model, mentor, and friend has passed away. He was one of the first to believe in the concept of Aura. He connected me with his team. He welcomed me into his home. His guidance paved the way, paved the path for my focus on Vegas. And because of his generosity, extending his network to me, I was able to secure the first clinics to use Aura in Las Vegas, which are American Addiction Center's treatment centers, at least Desert Hope is. And it's just very interesting that this is all happening right as Amanda Rabb was under Lima's care and she would pass away, unfortunately, in Las Vegas in one of those very treatment centers just about five or six months later. I am not saying Lima had anything at all whatsoever to do with any of this other than what she has said. That is all I have to go on is what she has said. So that's really all I have for now. There's a lot more I could have said, a lot more that there is to look into on this case, but it's already running a little bit longer than I really wanted this video to go. So for now, that's all we're really gonna have time for. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, Mina K, bye.